Let's start by revisiting our key ideas. We said an electrolyte can conduct electricity when in aqueous solution, and we showed that's because ions are formed, and those ions are able to move around, and that's what allows this electricity to be conducted. Well, what about the second part, this when molten part? How does that result in ions that can allow the conduction of electricity? We also said that all salts are electrolytes, but also some polar covalent compounds. How can polar covalent compounds be electrolytes when they are not made up of ions at all? We're going to address these issues as we continue discussing electrolytes. So let's start addressing these one at a time. First, we said that all ionic compounds are electrolytes, and we showed NaCl breaking into ions. And those ions allow the conduction of electricity. Now the issue is that not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. So how can they be electrolytes? Well, if I take something like barium sulfate, that's an ionic compound that doesn't dissolve in water to any real degree. It's still an electrolyte, because if you added enough heat and you melted barium sulfate, then the ions would be free to move around. So even if it doesn't dissolve in water, if it can conduct when molten, it's still an electrolyte. And that brings us to our second issue. Why don't all ionic salts dissolve in water? Well, this one's pretty straightforward. Sometimes the ions are attracted to each other strongly enough. So Ba2+, if we continue this example of barium sulfate, the barium ion in barium sulfate is attracted to the SO4 2 minus ion, the sulfate ion, strongly enough to resist the attraction to the dipoles of water. So these two ions have to resist the attraction to the dipoles of water. The barium 2 plus ion needs to resist the attraction to the oxygen partial negative dipole. And the SO4 2 minus, the sulfate ion, has to resist the attraction to the partial positive dipole, the hydrogens. So these attractions are there, but they are not nearly as strong as this one. This one is very strong and it wins out over the other attractions, keeping this ionic salt together and not letting water break it apart. The next thing we're going to look at is how a polar covalent compound can be an electrolyte. To show this, we're going to use the example of NH3. And NH3 is ammonia. If it dissolves in water, so if we put it into liquid water, something interesting happens. And this is based on the structure of the NH3. So NH3 looks like this. We have three hydrogens coming out of it. And it has two electrons left, a lone pair on the nitrogen. This region of the ammonia, the lone pair, is strongly negative, which means it can attract the positive dipole of water. It can attract this partial positive dipole on the hydrogen. And when that happens, it can sometimes pull this hydrogen right off. And that gives us the product of this dissolving. We see an NH4 plus aqueous ion. We see an OH minus the leftovers of the water, aqueous ion. And now we have ions in solution. And these ions, just like these ones up here, are able to conduct electricity. And that's what makes NH3 an electrolyte, because dissolving it in water resulted in the formation of ions. And those ions allow electricity to be conducted. Now, NH3 did not dissociate. So this reaction up here, this was dissociation. NH3 did not fall apart to become ions the same way that NaCl did. So it's not dissociation. This is instead called ionization. This is the ionization of ammonia. The last thing we're going to look at for electrolytes is the fact that electrolytes can be classified into strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. And strong and weak in this case with electrolytes mean something very specific. I'm going to use the examples of NaCl and ammonia that we just looked at. So here we have the reactions written out again. Table salt, NaCl, dissociates in water 
into Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. This reaction happens to completion. The entire amount of sodium chloride added to the water will dissolve into ions, provided there's enough water. So this reaction, we say, goes to completion. This is how it exists in water. There will be no solid NaCl left over. However, when you dissolve ammonia into water, not all of it gets converted into these ions. Not all of it ionizes. You still have some ammonia left over. And some of it has been ionized. Another way to show this is by using a double-sided arrow, showing that these can go back and forth from one side to the other. We never have all ammonia, and we never have just these ions. There's a mix of the two. So because not all of the ammonia ionizes, we call ammonia a weak electrolyte. Whereas table salt, on the other hand, completely dissociates, and we call that a strong electrolyte. So if something completely dissociates or ionizes, it's a strong electrolyte. If it doesn't completely dissociate or ionize, it's a weak electrolyte.